Um, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Sally Chambers from Eastern Kentucky uh, University. So let's welcome uh, Dr. Sally Chambers. Thank you. Can everybody hear me right now? Yes, ma'am. Okay, cool. So just share my screen, right? Okay, um, so as my talk alluded to, I am uh, talking about, or my title is alluded to in the um, announcement for the symposium, and thank you very much for inviting me to speak today. Uh, I will be talking about FERNS. It's one of my favorite study systems. I've worked with them a lot in Kentucky and beyond. So I'm going to talk about some research that I had the pleasure of doing this summer um, with a couple of great REU students, and I have to um, give some, a shout out to Raquel Gibson. She's an undergraduate student here at Eastern, and so she really has done a lot of the work over the summer with me and then continued um, to to work with me throughout the past couple semesters as well on this project. So she definitely deserves um, co-author status for this presentation. Um, okay, so why ferns, right? It's not a very common study system for scientists to work with. Um, but I think they're absolutely beautiful. These are some of my favorite pictures that I've taken um, throughout some of the field experiences that I've had, um, where I've had the pleasure to work with ferns both in Appalachia and in the tropics. Uh, and we're going to be talking about a couple ferns in this family down here, represented by these two pictures down here in the bottom left-hand corner. Um, but also in a, you know, a scientific sense, there are uh, really fascinating things about ferns and why I think they're a really cool study system in that regard. So if you're not familiar with this, uh, we call this cycle here on the left hand side, the alternation of generations. All plants follow this reproductive um, pattern, but it varies. They all have different flavors, and we'll talk about that in just a second. But to me, ferns are really cool because this is the only land plant lineage where we see these two generations living freely and independently of one another. So what I mean by that is that the, the plant that you all think of, the stage that you all think of when you think of a fern is the sporophyte stage. This is where we see the spores. This is how we mostly identify different fern species is by looking at the morphological characteristics in this life stage. Right. But the spores, once they go disperse throughout the environment and hopefully land somewhere suitable, they then germinate into this structure called a gametophyte. And the gametophyte is photosynthetic. It's capable of living independently of the sporophyte. And so that's why I think this is so cool, because we get to see both of these generations living independently of one another. They can both produce their own food and sustain different uh, populations. And we'll talk about that in a little bit more. Um, Let's see. Oops. Okay. Um, so just to kind of reiterate, all plants follow this uh, alternation of generations. But as we have gone through land plant evolution, we see a flip flop in the dominance of these life stages. So looking at bryophytes here, uh, very early in uh, evolutionary time in terms of land plant evolution, we see that we have a, a sporophyte that is nutritionally dependent on a gametophyte, right? But the, the dominant structure, when we look at a bryophyte, we look at any kind of a moss, we're looking at this gametophyte life stage. Here again, we have ferns represented, both photosynthetic organisms capable of living independently of one another. And then as we move for the, further forward in evolutionary time towards modern day, we see a significant decrease in the size of the gametophyte. So they're essentially reduced to, you know, a few cells in the uh, gymnosperms and the angiosperms. But all that's to say that ferns are a really interesting kind of evolutionary step where we do see this transition from these dominant life stage. So understanding land plant evolution by being able, able to study both of these organisms, I think is really, really interesting. Um, so to talk about the gametophyte, if you were to pick up any kind of basic plant biology textbook, this is what you would see. You would see this chordate, this little heart-shaped photosynthetic thing. But in reality, um, there's a lot more diversity to them, right? So. That's one of the things that I really like about gametophytes. Uh, again, here we see this little chordate structure, but there's all kinds of complex patterns to them to a degree, right? So we do see some morphological variation, but again, they're still very, very tiny, um, and there may not be a whole lot of characteristics to kind of go off of for morphology. 
Um, furthermore, back in the 90s, a uh, teratologist, so a, a fern researcher, said that the gametophyte was the handicap of the fern life cycle. And um, nowadays, myself and a lot of my fern colleagues do not agree with this. Uh, and we actually think that you know, the gametophyte life stage is the, the most important because this is where we have fertilization. This is where we get the production of a sporophyte. You can't have a sporophyte if you didn't have a gametophyte there in the first place, right? So again, ferns are really cool because we can have these comparative biology studies. And so this is some of the work that I've done um, throughout my career as a, as a, a botanist. And um, what we've studied with, with some of my colleagues is that we've we've done we've examined fern distributions um, and we've done some you know kind of manipulative studies as well. And we've come to this conclusion that gametophytes, even though they're so small and they look so frail, um, they're actually pretty hardy. So we can see that they can tolerate environmental conditions that their respective sporophytes cannot. Um, and so we think that's really interesting because that can play out in a geographic sense, right? And so sure enough, um, working with some other colleagues, we found that there are at least 25 species of ferns where there is no there is no sporophyte that's either produced. We have some of those in Kentucky. I call them Peter Pan ferns because they never grow up. Um, but then there's also these uh, instances where we see uh, geographic distributions where there's a gametophyte or a series of gametophyte populations, and then we don't see any sporophytes that are that uh, distant. So again, you know, looking at this in a geographic space, I think is a really neat thing to kind of understand. So we're seeing their physiological limitations um, kind of playing out on the landscape, if you will. So Hymenophilaceae is one of my favorite fern families. Um, in terms of a kind of collapsed phylogenetic tree of the ferns, we see that they're kind of down here. So they're relatively early diverging, um, but they're extremely diverse. So there's still about 600 species within uh, this order and within the family of Hymenophilaceae. Um, they're colloquially called the filmy ferns. And part of that is because of how thin their fronds are. So you can essentially see straight through them. Um, most of them are one cell layer thick. There's a few species that are two, but you know they're very, very beautiful, in my opinion, um, fronds to look at in the sporophyte generation. So really interesting in terms of an evolutionary perspective. Um, and you would think that they're, you know, being that thin, um, they're going to be very exposed to any kind of environmental stressors and variation. So, you know, part of the work that I'm really interested in, in doing in my career is understanding how, you know, conservation, understanding how species are going to uh, potentially respond to changes in climate. Um, so I've done this um, kind of research with other filmy ferns as well. So this is with a colleague of mine, um, Gerald Pinson. And so we did this work with a uh, Calistopterus baldwinii. We studied uh, distributions of sporophytes and gametophytes along an elevational gradient. And we did see that, you know, this in fact, these physiological limitations between the two generations do in fact play out in a landscape. And there is, it is tied to some environmental conditions. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about this later, but you do, we did see this really nice, you know, stair-step pattern where gametophytes are typically in warmer conditions on average than respective sporophytes are. And then the juveniles are kind of in the middle. So not fully grown sporophytes is what that represents. So I kind of wanted to take that idea, those ideas for study systems, and see what is happening with one of our local Hymenophilaceae. So this is Vitera, uh, Vandenbachia bachiana. Um, it is a filmy fern, Hymenophilaceae. It grows in these rock shelters. Uh, we, I'll show you a distribution here in a little bit, but mostly Eastern Kentucky, but it does get into Western Kentucky. Um, these are some pictures from a really nice population in Western Kentucky. Um, the fronds can get about yay big, um, but they do kind of just hang out. And then we see sporophyte or gametophytes rather that are going to be further out from the rock shelter um, edge. So more close to the mouth of the rock shelter. Uh, and here's a picture of Raquel collecting and observing um, this, these ferns in this little rock shelter here. Um, and then this is Julia, who I will give an acknowledgement to later. She was also uh, an REU student over the summer and she was also working in um, rock shelters just with a different kind of approach 
So uh, to really understand, potentially, are we seeing climatic differences between these sporophyte and gametophyte populations? What we did was we deployed some eye buttons. So there are these really tiny data loggers. Here's this, it's this little silver thing right here. And this particular model allowed us to monitor temperature and relative humidity. And so we put one out uh, in a sporophyte population and then one in a, an adjacent gametophyte population. Um, meaning that we only saw gametophytes in that little crevice. We didn't see any sporophytes being produced, right? So hopefully that would represent some of these physiological limitations or distributions of these two life stages. Um, we also wanted to look further at the sporophyte populations themselves. Um, so we took uh, a linear measurement. So essentially how long uh, uh, fronds were, like 15 fronds that randomly... Um, were scattered throughout a transect that bisected the population. Um, we also did a sterile and fertile count and uh, looked at also just the size of the population itself. So from one end of the population to the other, what was that total distance? Um, and these are the counties where you can find where we have recorded uh, effort, uh, you know, observations of Vandenbachia bachiana. Um, the dark green represents sporophytes, and then the light green, re light green represents gametophytes. Um, so we use this to help us pick a few study sites throughout um, throughout Kentucky. And I see Courtney Hal just joined, and so I have to give her a shout out because she was our Warren County, our Western Kentucky um, landowner. Very beautiful populations of this fern there. Uh, but we basically wanted to try to get as many sites as we could that scattered um, where we know these uh, observations are. So just to kind of go back to the talk before me, use iNaturalist, put those observations out there. They, they really do help us. Um, so what did we find? A little bit of some preliminary data. Raquel and I are still working on um, some of this this semester, but we found a pretty big range of fertile sporophytes from 17 to 52. Sterile sporophytes, much larger. One population had around 500. Um, and then there was was some senescence. So by that, we mean, you know, just kind of like brown and clearly dead, uh, not just desiccated, but clearly dead sporophytes. So 12 to 81. Um, we have done a very preliminary ANOVA, so a little bit of some preliminary statistics. We didn't find a significant difference um, among uh, like spron, uh, sporophyte frond length. Um, but I think we need to go back and refine that a little bit. And I do want to do some kind of pairwise analyses because clearly Cumberland Falls um, has a different, a significant difference in the sporophyte frond length for fertile and non-fertile. Um, so to look at temperature, uh, this is just a subset of our data so far, but we again put these data loggers out. They recorded an observation of temperature and humidity every 30 minutes. Um, we made sure that they were all running at the same time. So they all started at the same time. So each location should have been monitoring at the exact same um, minute of the day. And we have about six months of data so far, but what I have represented here, just a couple months. Um, again, we're still working on some of these analyses. And these locations here represent Cumberland Falls and Carter Caves. So just a subset of our, our data sets here. But interestingly enough, we can see that all of the temperature um, conditions are significantly different between gametophyte and sporophyte populations. Um, and essentially, sporophytes and gametophytes are, well, gametophytes are found in like higher temperatures consistently and lower temperatures consistently. So again, reflecting the fact that they can occupy areas further out um, from that rock shelter back wall. They can be a little bit further out and more exposed. So those are the temperature results. In terms of relative humidity, we don't see as much a significant difference um, in the way that we've kind of like sliced and diced our data here. So again, just a, few, a subset of, uh, of our results here, but essentially we only see significant difference um, in the amount of variation in relative humidity between sporophyte and gametophyte populations. And so sporophytes are able to um, kind of withstand a little bit more variation in humidity, at least during these months. So I think that once we add more data to this, it'll be really interesting because definitely seasonal um, differences will come into play, especially in these rock shelters. Um, and kind of the last step that I want to talk about that Raquel is going to be tackling this semester is confirming the identity of these gametophytes. So as I mentioned, they are a little bit more morphologically diverse than what we see in a typical textbook. They're not all this chordate shape, um, but there's still not a lot of information to go off of. And so 
there is another fern species that occupies a very similar habitat that looks very much like Vandenbachia bachiana gametophytes. Uh, this species is called Crepidomanes intricatum. It is one that never makes a sporophyte. But for us to be certain that we're looking at the proper gametophyte population, we have to use molecular tools to confirm that. So we have collected some gametophytes from the field. And then Raquel is going to follow this workflow in the lab here where she's going to extract DNA from those gametophytes. And then she's essentially going to compare that DNA to the DNA of Vandenbachia bachiana sporophyte. So it'll help us confirm identity of that um, and it's just a neat approach to follow, uh, you know, for kind of identifying all of these gametophytes. You kind of have, have to do that, essentially. Um, so with that, I would like to thank, again, Julia Fitzpatrick, the other REU student that I got to work with over the summer. She uh, will be graduating from Moorhead State soon. Uh, and then Dr. Kelly Watson. So she helped a lot with all of the field work over the summer and was a co-mentor uh, with me for the REU students. And so with that, I would like to thank you, and I'm happy to take any questions. Apologies again for the uh, slight technical difficulties. <laughs>